Hey everyone, we're back here to do another Rituals Jiu-Jitsu podcast. I'm really excited today. Our guest is Marcelo Tavares. Marcelo Tavares is a Jiu-Jitsu black belt uh, I know from Singapore. He's in town visiting Bali for a few days. He's a Brasileiro champion and a uh, Pan Pax champion. And uh, that's actually kind of like one of the first things me and Marcelo wanted to talk about was like, um, credi- like Jiu-Jitsu credibility. It was kind of like almost the topic. It's like it, it, almost like people look to define their coaches mm. off their achievements. Do you want to jump straight in and just talk about this? No, I think it's important the the titles or like the experience in tournaments. Yeah, you know because the 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 students really look up to you when you are competing, especially the ones that want to compete, and even the other ones, right? They 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 enjoy seeing uh, their coaches competing and fighting in a high level. But uh, for us, like for me, I, I I'm not super proud of the achievements I've made as a competitor. Uh, was a whole other time in my life and that it, that doesn't define at all what, who I am now. So that's, I think, the conversation you're having, right? Yeah, and I think it's a good conversation to have too because, mm. like, I think when you start jiu-jitsu and you're in it for competition and stuff, like, like the purpose is, is like, you just want to better yourself. It's part of that journey on the process of learning jiu-jitsu. It's, like, it's one thing to, like, practice drills in the gym and then you get to practice in sparring. Now you kind of want to up the ante a little bit and do it in um, a more intense, a more competitive setting. And... Now you realize the returns you get from doing it in that setting are are worth so much. Hmm. You know what I mean? As far as your growth in a, in a sense. Exactly. because and, and I think as a competitor, though, that's part of the reason why you compete. But on the outside looking in, especially like as you become a coach and um, like you move up the ranks and now you're like brown belt, black belt. As, uh, as newcomers looking in to say like, well, I'm trying to figure out what gym I'm going to train at. Hmm. But so who's the best? And exactly. it's, and and it's, it's so funny because what people think the best is all is defined by ability in competition, which is where things kind of get a little weird sometimes, right? Well, yeah, a lot of gyms they they want to future the coaches. Um, like we have like ten coaches, uh, world champions, but being a world champion doesn't say anything about your teaching abilities, right? Right. And uh, I think that's where that's what uh, the students should be looking for. You know, do a trial lessons everywhere and feel like who is actually um, a better fit to, to, to guide them through the process of learning jiu-jitsu, just like learning anything, right? Being a competitor, being a whatever, like doesn't really define, doesn't qualify you to teach, right? right. And I think that's what we're speaking here. 100%. So what are some of those qualities you feel like, let's say I'm new to jiu-jitsu, I'm a white belt, and uh, I'm just starting out. What are some of those qualities I should be looking for in a good coach? Well... I think caring is one of the most important one, right? So if your coach is not really caring about your progress, you're in the wrong place, right? Right. If he's just showing techniques, like after techniques, and just want to show how much jiu-jitsu they know, they're not a good coach. You know, right. they're just trying to show off something. I think it's, I mean, it's it's normal in the in the process of becoming a good coach to have that uh, showing off, you know. Phase. <laughs> phase. I mean, we know it because we've gone through it, right? But uh, I think one of the most important quality you're looking for in your coach is caring about you, caring about uh, your progress, you know. Right. And yeah, I think that's the thing that's like kind of hard to see coming in. It's like, or even sometimes you come in and you look up to these people so much. Maybe you're like a really big jiu-jitsu fan and maybe you're really lucky, like, uh, and you're and you're learning jiu-jitsu in a place where there are some big names around you. So you're already coming, kind of coming in with expectations of who this person's going to be because you see all their achievements. Mm. But then reality kicks in and who they are as people in the gym is really different than from what you've seen on like YouTube or watching them compete. Never meet your heroes, right? Yeah, <laughs> That's right. The whole thing. <laughs> but I, I mean, I think it's all you know, like we tend to idolize jujitsu competitors and stuff mm. like that a little too much sometimes and forget that they're real people. And then um, I think that sometimes... Real doesn't... people going through a lot in their in their own uh, process, right? Which is being a competitor. We always, like I think, we always talk about it when you're competitors, right? It's like a kind of a selfish journey, right? We, you need to focus on yourself. You need to know how to spend time on the mats, where to put your train on, who to train with, right? I mean, I'm not saying that we need to because I've changed a lot my mentality about it, but that's the culture, right? right? So, and then how that person will keep two lives, you know, like being a high level competitor and and a good coach. It's difficult, it's possible though, mm. but I, I, I think it's very difficult. Yeah, I think so too. And then also, I feel like part of your journey too is like, 
at some point in jujitsu, there's there's a shift where it's like as your skill level improves, people almost expect you to coach. Mm. You know what I mean? And other sports aren't like that. Like for me, it was around purple. Like my coach really started pushing me to to coach more mm. and more. He's like, I want you to teach more classes. I think you're going to be a really good coach. This and that, you know, which he was right. Like that was the right move for me. But a big part of me wanted to focus on being a competitor still. Mm-hmm. So I got kind of torn early on. Did you have like a, did you have a moment like that where it was like maybe early for you where you were starting to coach more when you should have been focusing more on competing? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I think it was when I, I would tell like a funny story. But uh, before, was uh, when I was already in Singapore as a black belt, uh, training very hard every day and competing every day that I realized, you know, my job is actually teaching. Mm. And I love doing that. I'm I'm not in love with training every day, like doing sparring every day and competing with my teammates and then going to a competition. I think that was taking a lot of me, mm. you know. And uh, it was kind of stopping my progress as a person. I felt in that moment. So and then I went back on focusing on teaching, and I really found myself again, you know. And a funny story is that I remember I was a kid when I started jiu jitsu. I was eleven. And I remember my very first day, I loved it. And then I called my, my cousin, hey, let's meet at my place. I'm going to teach you. Mm. So I started teaching jiu-jitsu on my very first day. I was oh, replicating exactly what I was learning in the class. And then that we did it for like six months, mm. you know. So I progressed so much. I'm not saying that <laughs> you should do that. But it was a funny thing that happened to me. And sometimes I remember this and say like, wow, this is amazing, right? Yeah. I was already finding my... My path back then, mm. um, like 20, 22 years ago. Yeah, that's it's amazing. amazing. <laughs> yeah. Um, can you share a little bit about your experience training jiu-jitsu in Rio? Because, I mean, you're from like a really famous team in Rio. GF Team's like a huge team. Is, mm. is, did you start with GF Team or did you, was there another club you were with first? No, I started at a, a small gym. Not as small, actually. We were pretty big in my city, which is not Rio. It's next to Rio. Like, it's 30 minute driving. It's called Duque de Caxias. It's actually the same uh, city of um, Bruno Malfacini. Mm. You know, we actually came from different teams. Oh, okay. We're friends nowadays, but back then was a big thing, right? Was yeah. Like a lot of um, rivality. Oh, uh, rivalry. R- yeah. Rivalry, yes. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> and uh, it was amazing because um, <clears throat> such a, I think this happened everywhere, right? Mm-hmm. We, people used to fight on the streets when you meet each other and... You know, you're from this team, I'm from this team, so uh, that's where I start jiu-jitsu. What was your question, Justin? Sorry. We were, I was just... Training uh, back then, that was, yeah. that was my my experience training uh, in those days, right? We trained jiu-jitsu and actually had to fight on the streets just because you're training jiu-jitsu. Mm-hmm. So you're not learning jiu-jitsu to defend yourself uh, only, but uh, once you start training jiu-jitsu, you need to know how to defend yourself because you're probably going to get into a fight on the street. Oh, interesting. You know? Yeah, and is that quite common in Brazil for that to kind of happen, at least in that not generation? Anymore, yeah. Not anymore, but back then, yes. Uh, and f- f- another funny thing is that with one year of jiu-jitsu, I, I had a cauliflower year, and I was 12. Wow. So, like bigger guys, they used to look at me and try to pick fight all the time. So I was always fighting. But, yeah. But, you know, like... I had to try to explain this to my parents and in in and they never believed me because I, I was not trying to fight. Yeah. You know, people were picking fights on me all the time and then I have this whole reputation of someone who liked fight. But you know, I, I, even now I think like I had no much of a choice. I had to. Yeah. You know what You're I mean? just being forced into that situation. Exactly. Interesting. So when when did Jiu Jitsu kind of start taking like a bigger role in your life where it wasn't just such like a hobby or something you were doing for fun? When did it kind of seem to take like uh, maybe this was going to be a career and a lifestyle for you? I was actually pretty late as a, as a purple belt, like almost as a brown belt. I started taking it more seriously. Yeah. I was always on and off in Jiu Jitsu, you know. Um, I played football which was my first passion and I want to make it to professionals. I say like whenever I I supposed to be playing football, I decided to do jiu-jitsu, which was when I was 11, 12. Mm-hmm. And then I left football. And then whenever I supposed to be doing jiu-jitsu, I left back to football. Oh, interesting. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. But and then when I was like Italo started, like I think my professor Italo who gave me the black belt, 
he started jiu-jitsu we were like childhood friends and he started jiu-jitsu one year after me mm. like and then we trained together so much and then when i stopped jiu-jitsu to play football whatever he really grew right and then he became a black belt competing all over the world which made me really really inspired me yeah and then he was always saying no you should come back you know you you have really good talent so you should come back to jiu-jitsu and then i was always thinking you know yeah. but um yeah i never took it so serious and then when i got a purple belt i started training again with italo already as a black belt mm. and then he said you know start teaching him the gym and then i did i never stopped anymore yeah you know I think it was purple belt uh, and then brown belt. I really stopped everything else in my life and dedicate my life 100% to jiu-jitsu. So do you think that's part of what uh, inspired you was like, and you kind of said this already was, or it made it seem more achievable for you seeing like a friend like Italo get to black belt and then you saw him reaping the rewards of getting his black belt, living this jiu-jitsu lifestyle, traveling and competing. And then it made it feel like something that you could do as well. Was that kind of like the pivotal like what kind of inspired you to go never, further with never it? thought about it never thought about it but maybe you know yeah. maybe having that close um um example right yeah like he can do it so maybe i can do it too exactly you know i remember having that those feelings you know because honestly i was not in a good place in my life in terms of uh, which i think is normal right uh you know you're 18 19 or 20 in brazil you know you you discover partying, drinking, and all this stuff. So I was not focused on really anything. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, seeing Italo, of course, very focused and training every day and traveling the world. It's like, no, I can do it as well. Of mm. course, thinking about it now. Um, but I, I didn't set up any big expectation for myself. I yeah. was only doing what felt right for me at the moment, which is focusing jujitsu and think that those small decisions that I made, you know, opening a class 7 a.m. in the morning, for example, start changing my life, right? Because I had to be there. I need to focus on my students. Um, and the group was growing and everything happened very organically. But I think what I'm trying to say is that it was not a big expectation. Yeah. I was actually already starting understanding the process, right? So right. I want to do this and I would do that and whatever life bring me, you know, to. Yes, I mean, that's really like the step-by-step -step approach mm, you need exactly. with jiu-jitsu to be successful with it. Pretty much anything in life, it's like, we're going to take it to this point and then see where it goes. And then for sure, we'll see what reveals itself, right? For sure. Small changes that, you know, habits, right? That change our whole life, you know? Yeah. But we don't see that way. We're always looking for the big change, right? Yeah, always yeah. chasing for the big change. Exactly. And it's like that road to success is never a straight line. You know, we always want it to be really, really easy. It's sort of like, oh, yeah, sure, I just need to do this. But then the reality of it is that there's always pitfalls and a lot of mistakes made. And, mm. um, you know, it's, it's again, like, I think it's something that's probably jujitsu taught both of us quite a bit is like learning to deal with failure. You know what I mean? Because, like, in jujitsu, when, when you learn jujitsu, you're failing a lot, you're having a lot of struggle and a lot of adversity that you gotta gotta kind of work through. And I think jujitsu is like a process to help you. Uh, learn to deal with that happening in life. It's like a coping mechanism almost, a practice that helps yeah. deal with it. I would go even further. I think what uh, actually really clicked my mind is that those things are inevitable, right? So mm. honestly, I know it's very hard. It's easy to say, say than done, but uh, I honestly see those points as uh, not as a failure, right? It, they are part of succeeding. Yes. I can't. I can't succeed without falling, right? Mm. And that happens on the mat every day. So that kind of accelerates our our uh, awareness about it because, you know, we deal with it every day. We train with someone better than us. You're trying to do a good job and progress, but and then you, you're being tapped out and or whatever. Like, we're dealing with failure all the time. Mm. But again, you cannot skip that. You cannot jump to, you know, to be a better in a better level in jiu-jitsu from here to there without going through this mm. so i will start seeing the the failure as opportunities to grow right right so yeah that's great i think that's a really like healthy process and mm. stuff like that so what was the first moment for you where you got an opportunity to go like international with your jiu-jitsu was a competition a seminar anything like that or a teaching job 
Oh, that's very interesting because right now when you jump into this topic, right? I the goal is to help more people to go through that path, and I think that's why you have you're asking this question as well. So, which is fantastic. Um, but it never happened again, like one big thing, right? I was so focused on teaching jiu-jitsu and training every day that I built such an amazing um, uh, group around me in my back, back in Rio. And that was a competition in Argentina. It was my very first international trip. And then I, and then I went and I competed and it was amazing. Um, then I came back and then I got that feeling, right? I can't do it, you know, I can do more. Yeah. You know, why I'm just training here, I can do it more. And then I got that feeling. But and then years later, um, I think also because, that's my point, because of this focus, you know, Italo called me from Singapore and say, you know, Marcelo, that will be a, a job opportunity here in Singapore. So I said, Italo, I don't speak English, you know. He says mm. like, you know, you learn. Yeah, you know, and I did. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm very grateful for that. But uh, I think I'm very happy, very grateful for his um, opening, for him to open his opportunity for me. But I also think that is a lot about my discipline and focus on every single step along the way. You know, yeah. not just you know aiming. I want to be there. I want to be in Singapore teaching jujitsu. I want to travel the world yeah. teaching or training and competing. No, but to get there, I need to do my things here. Mm. And I think I was always focused on these things, mm. you know, and I think that's the point for me. Yeah. You know, um, whatever you will want to get, I think that's what I learned. Whatever you want to get, if you will actually understand and break down the, the, the goals, I mean, the tasks that you need to get there yeah. and focus on that instead of in the goal, we will, we will fly, we will get even further. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. So like uh, I, I'm just from, from what I know about you too. It's like uh, I even remember meeting you early on. Like your English wasn't that great, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? We could talk a little bit, but I, you were still in like the early days yeah. of you learning English and stuff. Do you think the work ethic jujitsu gave you and the ability to kind of like work through uh, adversity and struggle? Were you able to apply that same mindset to learning English? Absolutely, and uh, all the way around. I yeah. think learning English helped me to be the coach I am today. Oh, interesting. Because it brought, I, I, I actually, this is a very important subject, you know, mm. uh, for me, because I think the pattern of learning a language, Jiu-Jitsu is a language, mm. right? Yeah. In uh, the, that pattern that I found, the, the struggle that I was having to learn English made me understand what my students were going through to learn jiu-jitsu yes and then i also understood like how i struggle to learn jiu-jitsu you know mm. then i start creating different uh, ways to connect techniques to one another because this is what we do when you're speaking a language right yes we don't learn words broken you know like out of nowhere but yet in jiu-jitsu i feel like the structure of classes are still very cake right so you go to a class and the teacher teach you three different movements every day, right? So how many classes have you done in Jiu-Jitsu in your whole life? Oh, Just saying. I have no let, idea. Let, let's, say, let's say you're in a class about 5,000 hours yeah. on your whole life. Yeah. So that means that you should have, you should know 15,000 techniques. <laughs> yeah, right? Right. This is amazing, right? Yeah. But that work doesn't work like that. It doesn't. You know, so you need to keep going back and forth in the techniques because when you learn the techniques, you just see it. You don't actually learn it. You don't observe it, right? Absolutely. And that pattern made me realize this and then I tried to understand how to create a better program to teach Jiu-Jitsu. Absolutely. And I think that's the big thing missing in most academies still is structure. Like, uh, I don't know why the culture of Jiu-Jitsu has always been like, and you're right, it's almost kind of this show-off culture from coaches where it's just like, and, and you see it in students too, they just want to see something new. Mm. And you see how excited they're like, oh, I've never seen that before. It's like such a big deal for them to see something they haven't seen before, especially they've been training for a few years. They're like blue belt, purple belt level. They're really like kind of chasing. They're just like, I want to see something new. But it's like, well, what you really need to do is be practicing all this other stuff we've been showing you so you really understand it. Because there's a difference between like recognizing moves and understanding moves. 
and taking the time to really get in depth with moves and how they work and the mechanics and everything. Like, uh-huh. uh, like kind of like almost what you taught today is a great example of you going like, that's such a reflection of how much time you spend on your fundamentals. Like we did like, uh, Marcelo taught, taught a class at my academy today and it was all just focused on knee, knee cut pass. But the details are from someone that has spent years and years practicing knee cut passes, you know? Mm. So his details are very refined. And it transitioned very well into every other move that he did. But again, this comes from refinement of fundamentals for someone to like to, to take the time to dive that deep into the single techniques, you know? Mm. Yeah, I love doing this with my students, you know, giving them the opportunity to, to experience the position, right? Mm. We show the techniques, right? That's fine. We talk about it. We talk about the concepts and then, but I always tell them, look, give give yourself time and try to feel the position right yeah and then sometimes we do like minutes of drills just for them to understand that how to behave in the position the behaving is is what matter the most for me right I, i'm always talking about the behaving right mm. and um and i think when it comes back to like old school jiu-jitsu nobody talks about behaving right? yeah they just show the technique the technique behind the technique i'm sure the oh, just is perfect, as to say, you know? Yeah. Sometimes I take myself thinking about the technique that I was taught as a white belt and never worked, but why? Mm. It's just because, you know, there was no concept behind it, you know, no behaving, no whatever, but just the pure technique. But and then if you actually go deep down on that technique, you will see a lot of concepts behind it. Right. Right? So, I mean, it's a really interesting subject. I can talk about it for ages. Yeah, right. <laughs> and. Uh, um, I, and I also find that like uh, there's techniques that maybe my coach should be at white belt or blue belt that I thought I understood. But then mm. I look back at what they, they were actually trying to show me and it gets more clear. And I'm like, oh, man, it took me like eight years to figure out what you're actually talking about all that time. But now I get it. It like finally clicks one day. So I think also as a coach, it's super important to plant seeds of like growth in your students. It's like you might not understand this today, but one day you will. And I think where I started to experience that kind of firsthand, like sometimes even later, it was probably around like blue or purple belt. Um, I would have done a move that I learned at blue and now I was purple and I was a little bit more athletic. My movement was more refined. My technique was better. And now I went back and tried those moves and they became more, a lot more natural. Mm. It's just I wasn't ready for them the first time I saw them. But it's good that they planted the seed of that technique, you know? Yeah, I mean, we're never ready to, to do it, something new, right? But yeah. that's the thing. I feel... If you give our students uh, time to discover it, you know, mm. to be in that situation for longer than like four minutes drill each class for each for each technique, we they will progress. They will have that progress that you that we had mm. in three four years in a much shorter period. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like specific sparring is an, is an amazing opportunity to. To try that right right so because you're actually focusing on that specific position but i think even under specific sparring you can make drills that will help them to to feel that technique and build the confidence behind the technique which right. usually again going back to that uh, old school way of teaching we will practice the drill for three minutes and then change to another drill completely different so we didn't actually have the opportunity to to learn that right yeah and that's why i love i always like so much the way uh justin teaching jiu-jitsu because like you spend so much time building the ability like mm. the, the the core ability right and all the 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 spinning and how to use your weight so things that uh that they will carry for life mm. you know that will teach them much more than one technique or, or two right but and then on top of that you always build the techniques right so you show the technique as well it's not just moving yeah but um yeah so and i see you always developing on top of that same core uh techniques that you showed me when i was here for the first time you know yeah what I mean? yeah and this is fantastic it's like and that's how you fight as well yeah which is a completely different thing right so yes i think teaching and uh you want to teach your students things that actually works for you. Yes. Right? Yeah. And um, with that mentality, you actually get to understand better what you do and improve your jiu-jitsu, improve their jiu-jitsu. It's amazing. Yes. You know, this is fantastic. 
Yeah, I think uh, something I learned pretty early on is not to be like too territorial over my own jujitsu mm. because there's always going to be a day that comes that somebody shows up in the gym that has better jujitsu than mine. And I need to be ready for their, what, whatever movement they're going to throw at me, you know? So if, if I limit my, the depth of my knowledge, mm. you know what I mean? If I, if I, if, or if I'm hiding techniques for my students, then when that guy finally comes that hits that counter... I'm not ready for it. And then I get stuck in whatever that is, you know, I much rather show everyone what I'm doing. And so they can try to develop their own counters around it. So when that day comes, I'm prepared for it. You know, I'm ready to now scramble in those positions where I usually would have been guarded, mm. you know, and then, and then just like you said, that opens up a whole new door of a, or a whole new level to the depth of those techniques. Mm. You know what I mean? So it's like, what whatever the technique is, like, let's say, Let's bring it down so where people can understand. Maybe it's like we're talking about like an arm bar. Maybe mm. I have like a great arm lock, but I know there's a counter for it, but I never show people how to stack and defend mm. an arm bar. Then when the guy comes and actually knows how to stack, I get crushed because I'm never put in a stack. I never understand the transitions around the arm bar defense. Mm. I need to allow myself to be put in a stack so I can learn to work around the stack and get out of it. You know what for I mean? For sure, for sure. And like how many how many athletes do we see make that mistake constantly? You know what I mean? Where they just don't allow to put themselves in the positions where the counters can happen, you know? Uh, definitely. And I speak a lot to my coaches about it. Um, we have always like, I have a few brown belts that are two, two of them living in Singapore um and a few of them live in different countries like Italy, England, whatever. But uh we are always talking about it, right? I lit I literally give them everything I know mm. and that's the only way that I evolve my jiu jitsu. Mm. You know, I feel like you know, I teach them literally like how to pass my guard. Yes. Right? If you do this you're gonna pass my guard. And then they do and pass they go and pass. But I feel like somehow this is the thing, jujitsu is so like organic, like in it, not. I mean, it gives back to me straight yeah. away, you know, because they found that um, that specific ability to deal with that position. I have to find another solution, you right. know, and then always happens, and we are always growing together, right? Right. So that is no reason to 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 write to to hide anything from from our students, right? And I feel like this is a, of course on our culture it's an old school mentality yeah yeah um and especially because like i think we came up a time in a jiu-jitsu where it's like the only time you really got to see diversity in styles in jiu-jitsu so you got to think for us this is like pre-youtube this is pre mm -hmm. like if you want to watch world championships you had to buy like a dvd from ibjjf or something <laughs> yeah. like that you know uh, or you had to be at the tournament it's a great time to start jiu-jitsu right? it was it was crazy and with that came that we had to study people live and like pay attention to what they did. And that's where we got new jujitsu or you had to be part of their team where they were willing to share it with you. You know what I mean? So and nowadays we don't have that. The culture of jujitsu, again, is going through this shift because we have things like YouTube and BJJ Fanatics and tons of coaches but putting th their that, series. That's what out. I meant. It's a it's a fantastic time to start jujitsu. That information is everywhere. It is now. Right. But it's kind of weird because it's kind of like there's so much information Nobody knows what to focus on, the new guys, you know what I mean? They get so lost True. in just looking at what jiu-jitsu is, you mm. know what I mean? And it's like, and uh, people get really confused on like fundamentals. I think fundamentals is still like a really gray area in jiu-jitsu. Mm, amazing. Uh, if, if you allow me to say, just yeah. it's just that, uh, you know, I've been having this conversation. We are about to launch our online program next month. Uh, we just... Before I come to, to Bali, I was recording the first videos and we were always back and forth on these, like, how are we going to start these and shall we start from the beginning, beginners, or shall we just do like a um, specific technique um, and concept? And then it's like, let's do basics, you know, yeah. let's create a basics program because mm. basics is for everyone, right? Yeah. It can be for white belt, but I feel like even I travel a lot training jiu-jitsu and teaching and I meet black belts that don't have a good foundation, you know, yes. for that game. Yeah. It's the same thing you're speaking, right? You ask them to do an umbar, sometimes they will do three, four types, three, four different types of umbars, but not consciously, right? They are changing yeah. the hand from here, there. So meaning that the foundation is not there. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, so that's why just taking the opportunity to talk about my Your my online, online program. program so yeah, yeah. no yeah. plug it plug it let people know <laughs> no, no. um but yeah like uh, i also think like uh 
here, here's something, and I talked about this with uh, one of my last guests too, is I think fundamentals are kind of a loose term because there's like the fundamentals of what? Yeah, exactly. So, so it's like, like someone comes to me, why well, well, I want to learn fundamentals. I'm like, well, what do you want to get good at? You want to get good at arm bars? Because there's fundamentals of arm bars that you need to learn. Mm. You want to get good at leg locks? Okay, well, let's teach you the fundamentals with straight ankle lock first. Mm. You know, so you can understand some transitions around and what makes the foot lock game work. Um, I want to be a guard player. Okay, well, let's teach you some close guard and spider guard fundamentals or something like that. Just so we're starting to put the framework together for a game. You know, really any system has fundamental, uh, fundamental framework around it. And then we expand from there. Definitely. You know, and so like when people ask like, well, what are fundamentals in jiu-jitsu? It's like, it's really kind of like what you want to build your game around and what you want to be good at, you know? So uh, I think bringing it back to like really old school jiu-jitsu is good. Like obviously you want escapes, uh, understanding dominant positions, uh, bad positions, getting a feel for all that stuff. But then after that, it's kind of like breaking it down and giving your students the the building blocks to build a game for themselves, you know? And that's what I call the basics. Yes. Right? And um, yeah, I figured that uh, our basics is very strong because I put a lot of time thinking about it. So I would say, you know, we have basic jujitsu in a very modern way. Yes. Like taking the techniques that uh, were taught, you know, years ago, um, like a scissor sweep, like a si simple yes. scissor sweep, right? How many times people do that in the sparring? very low like very it's, low it's like there is no many people using that but this is a fantastic technique and the reason why they don't do it is because the basics are not strong yes and then like you see blue belts going straight to x guard how yeah. can you learn x guard if you don't know how to do a scissor sweep you don't know how to play de la riva you don't know how to make that transition all the way to x guard right you know what i mean but uh and then people have a strong position maybe if they get on this x guard they will make the sweep but all the way there, they already got the guard past it. Yep. You know what I mean? So yep. you got to learn the basics. But uh, I get your point and I agree. Um, fundamentals that are like, I can be very advanced in an armbar yeah. and not have the fundamental skills to do um, um, a guillotine. So, right. you know yeah. what I mean? Or like even going deeper, like uh, wider, like you can have a great bottom game but a really bad top game. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. So, I think something my coach did for me. Uh, one of my like coaches that helped me the most was a guy named Dave Camarillo, and he used to always say, "It's like you have belt levels and skills of jujitsu. So it could be like you could be a blue belt at passing guard, but then have like yeah. a brown belt at submissions. You know what I mean? And then maybe like a purple belt level guard or whatever it is. So it's like." You got to look at all those skills and you got to build all those skills in separate areas. And the better you can get that kind of uniform across the board, the better. Because we see it all the time. Like maybe you see like a really fantastic blue belt coming to the gym and they have like black belt level passing. Mm. But then they got no submissions. Mm. You know what I mean? Because they're overdeveloped in one area of jujitsu. And uh, yeah, it's it's crazy. You know, the way, the way I build my my program, you know, I'm always I consistently talk about standing top and bottom game. Mm. Right. And uh I used to, usually I teach each day having that first, uh, the subject, the, the most important subjects, for example, the standing game, which are like guard pull, takedowns and stuff. Uh, but this is the primary subject of the class, but we are always doing, connecting with the top and bottom game. Mm. Like, as I was showing today in class, right? So yes. the guy on the top are doing the, the knee cut pass, but the guy on the bottom needs to do some work. Right. Right. You cannot just be chilling there with, you know what I mean? Which is a very common scene. I always, I'm always making fun of it. Um, but you got to have these three types of games uh, connecting, you know, and right. going together. Otherwise, you know, I see a lot of people saying, you know, but I'm going to focus on my bottom game. Fine. It's, it was really nice to take different times of your, of your journey to focus on one technique. Yeah. But you, you can't just practice one type of game because if you're good in sweeping you're gonna come up yeah so what you know what i mean so things i feel like if we actually prepare things can grow together mm. maybe slow slower yeah like in one level the bottom game will not be as good as as you're saying right some guys are fantastic playing especially with this bearing bowler generation right yeah fantastic doing bearing bowler and all of this but and then when it comes to to guard passing not so good or you know 
the, all the way around. But uh, yeah, I really like to work like this with standing top and bottom game. And just one more thing, um, jumping in what you're saying, that is this gym, that was the first time I saw it, they doing, um, like the students uh, in the gi, they, may, they might be a purple belt, but they are blue belt in no gi. Mm. Right, which is very interesting. First, in the, when I first heard about it with my Brazilian jiu jitsu culture, it's like no bullshit. Yeah, you know, one and but the and same, then right? I start thinking about it, you yeah. know, and then I feel like it makes a lot of sense because I will make a confession here for you, Justin. <laughs> I never ever in my life attended an Ogi class. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, interesting. As a student, you know, yeah, before yeah. I become a black belt, yeah, and um, so and I always competed as. In a, in Ogi, yeah, you know, so that's super interesting, right? Because I think it's, it, it it is a different game, you know yeah. what I mean? So in we're seeing that now more than ever because mm. I think that there was like a big split, maybe like in the last five years, mm. where we finally started to see a lot of the guys. Because what what we used to always say in jujitsu, it's like an old saying. If you train gi, you're also going to be good at no gi. Mm. But no gi players can't put on a gi and perform well. Mm. But now we're seeing a shift where the guys that have only focused on no gi are kind of really jumping ahead of the gi players. You know, we saw it with the Danaher team, basically, right? Yep. Um, and we saw this big shift and where it, they couldn't get away with just training gi all the time and then taking the gi top off. And then you were just as good, you know? Mm. And I think the, the big area that comes up is leg locks, right? The emphasis on how much uh, the no gi... The new new school nogi generation focuses on attacks on the legs and attacking the the feet. Uh, I think it's been the big, and also, the big shift in nogi jujitsu. You know, and also I think the way that uh, we use our weight mm. in the nogi, you know, in jujitsu I think with the gi we we kind of miss that point because we are consistently holding things and sometimes you're actually holding your own weight. Right. You know, and you're making grips and then you're holding and you know you're doing much more strength than what you need when you actually just let it go yeah you know and then that's what you see gordon ryan doing amazingly right yeah he throws himself and pass the guard with leg weaving his slice all the time yeah so it's not all about foot locks and stuff but definitely um these uh whole new uh heel hooks and these techniques open a different door for for the nogi guys you know i think so and also wrestling like i think having like a foundation of wrestling we're also seeing as a playing a big, bigger and bigger factor. From what I understand in Brazil now, a lot of jiu-jitsu schools are always looking for wrestling coaches. They want to learn like American style wrestling, freestyle wrestling, Greco and stuff like that. Mm. Um, like at least, w w like recently talking to Samir, Samir's another black belt training at my gym right now. He's saying in Sao Paulo, like coaches are always looking to hire wrestlers to come in and like give seminars to help everyone understand takedowns better. I think so too. I think so too, especially with how like, in the first years of MMA, jiu-jitsu was the thing, right? Yeah. Nobody knew how to how to deal with jiu-jitsu, right? And then we went all the way up. But and then when um, like Americans start putting more work on the wrestling to MMA, yeah. Then we had a whole generation of fighters, you know. Yeah. Um, taking over the the top um, of um, of uh, the UFC and all the biggest tournaments. And uh, I think now no gi is much more uh, popular in Brazil than, than ever. Yeah. And uh, definitely wrestlers will jump ahead on that, you know. So and I was actually talking about it with one, one friend from Brazil. I haven't been in Brazil for ages, like yeah. training and staying there. But he was telling me this, you know, Marcelo, I think, you know, no gi will be big here very soon. Mm. And my school is only focusing on Ogi. Yeah, wow, so it's interesting. So it's, it's good to hear that because it makes a lot of sense, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I think it really helps. Actually, something you touched on earlier about, like, when you were talking about the fundamentals of what students need to know, you basically pointed out three areas. It was standing uh, on top and on bottom, basically, mm. to put it simply. And uh, that was something I always explained to me really early on, too, is that there's three levels that you need to be ready to defend yourself mm. at on your feet, on your knees or on your back. Mm. So I think this and what I think the problem is with most academies, they only focus on how you fight from your knees and on your back. Mm. 
and they never teach you how to stand. So, mm. I mean, the big hole in sports jiu-jitsu is takedowns, right? Exactly. Like not being prepared to take someone down or even learning how to pull guard properly. If you're if you're in a sport environment, a lot of schools, all they teach is the same thing. Put your foot on the hips, hip, sit on your butt, grab a collar, and now good luck. You know what I mean? But there's so many more ways to go into it than that, you know? And I also think that is a, a, a bad culture in least because, you know, especially... Um, I don't want to say Americans, but uh, yeah. I've heard a lot of from from Americans, and uh, there's a saying that you know you don't pull guard, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pull, pulling guard is for like whatever, you know. Yeah, I don't want yeah. to say bad words, but I think we tend to to have that kind of behavior when you don't understand something. Yes. Right. So in my classes, I spend a lot of time bringing the fight down, you know, and. Pulling guard is always a fantastic way to start the fight, right? Absolutely, especially in sports jiu-jitsu. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah, we put a lot of um, focus on on pulling guard. What I feel like I missed my track. Oh, just either that or takedowns. You know, you were kind of touching on like, and I'll agree with you, American culture, we have this stigma about pulling guard. Yeah, yeah. But man, you watch a lot of the top level guys, almost everyone's pulling guard. You know what I mean? It's very rare where people go, to, go for takedowns unless they're a very high level wrestler. Or it's going to be that sort of exchange, you know, where it's like, you know, both people have good top games and they're going to fight for takedowns. Yeah. Like that. So what I want to say before is, um, yeah, I, I, the way I work in Singapore, for example, right, I teach a lot of people from different gyms, from different academies, right? Yeah. And it's amazing how they, they don't know how to start the fight. Yes. I need to walk them through like very specific things you know where you're gonna grab how and why you're making this grip you know if you're studying on your knees i always advise my students to never ever start fighting on their knees yeah. you know i mean we can start one person on the knee and one person on the bottom which is already defined who is playing guard and who is playing top game right right um but i feel like in most academies people are wrestling on their knees which is like way far from jiu-jitsu yeah right you basically wrestling with your arms your legs are blocked so you can't do much right and then you do a guard pull from there it's actually painful yeah right probably yeah. gonna get your guard past it already yep so i always put them you know i my advice is start from standing start from early ages getting yeah. used to pull guard or taking the person down yep and also defending the guard pull yes right so but and then when it comes to starting sparring uh, on their knees, I always like communicate about it, guys. Just say like I want to pull, I want to play guard, you know, or just sit down, right? And yeah. then the other person will go on the knees. But and then if you if you're on top, you say like, can I play, can I play guard now? You just communicate, right? Communication yeah. is such a big thing. It's, yeah, you see this so much with white belts. I call it knee wrestling. You know what I mean? And it drives me crazy. And like, just one of you play bottom. You know what I mean? Exactly. Or stand up and you guys go for takedowns. You know, but don't wrestle from your knees. You know. But that's uh, the white belts. They need to be taught, right? But yeah. The 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 part that you know makes me a little bit uh, you know is that you still see brown belts doing that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So and then you feel like you know. Dude, we, we need to change it. We need to talk about it with our students and, you know, to tr try to make a sense out of it because that knee wrestling is not beneficial for anyone. And then no. sometimes spend one, two minutes of the sparring in that battle Yeah. while you could actually be developing your your guard or like your guard retention if someone passes your guard. All those parts of Jiu-Jitsu are important. Yes. Right? But because also people are looking at... It's a big subject, by the way. Yeah. Looking at a great beginning. Yeah. They tend to screw up in the very beginning, right? Yeah. They want to start the fight already ahead, like either with a takedown, the guard pass it, yeah. or with a pull guard and a triangle. Yes. Right. So the the very fast attack. Yeah. But I always tell them, look, start the fight. You know, go for a knee cut position, for example. You are not trying to pass the guard very fast. Yeah. But you're actually understanding a lot about that that distance that you can manage it you know 100 percent. yeah like uh i was thinking about this yesterday after our role too like we, we we're both at the point where we have enough experience where there's a feel out process you mm. know what i mean and you also see this a lot in striking you never see a high level striker just like running guns blazing because they get mm. knocked out if they do that jujitsu is the same you know like we got to be careful with our approach as we go into roll with someone it can't be too aggressive right away because if we come off too aggressive right away we're we're gonna pay the price there's always exactly. a heavy price to pay for that so mm. like and i tell my guys this all the time because there's like especially white and blue belts 
are overly aggressive with the grip fight. They like don't want the other person to touch them at all, at all. And I'm like, no, let them get grips. See how they're gripping you. See how they're fitting in to like try a pass. Because this is where you're going to learn how they're moving and like the positions that come around it, you know. But they're, the, everyone seems to be in such a hurry in the beginning. Not that we were any different. <laughs> no, we we're not. <laughs> Definitely. I was, bro, uh, my whole competition career was building arm umbars and uh, fly umbars and fly triangles. Yeah. You know, that's what was always about it. You yeah. Know? <laughs> if the fight uh, lasted more than one minute, I would lose it. You yeah. Know? That's for sure. <laughs> but... Uh, it goes back to our earlier subject that is giving our students the opportunity to experience it. You yes. Know? Not just doing the sparring, but building drills that they will feel it, you know, and build their confidence. Oh, that's okay. Actually, if I, if I go here and I put my hand here, I go for a knee cut pass and I stay there, you know, then just saying it, you know, don't do this, do that. You know, I, I can hear you, but maybe I, I don't know if that's true, right? Yeah. I need to experience it. But if I just, if my only opportunity to experience it during the sparring is too little. Yes. You know, so I think there is a, a lot of room to, to giving the students a space through drills for them to, to discover. And that's jujitsu, right? It is discovering. Yes. If you put two people in the room every day, that don't know jiu-jitsu at all and say, guys, you have to to, to wrestle with yeah. the gi, they will develop, they will learn without destruction, yeah. right? So this is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So you see like this happening in countries that there are no black belts at all. Yes. Right? I traveled to Sri Lanka, for example, my good friend um, uh, Titsira teaching there was a white belt, mm. right? Yeah. And in a lot of times I spoke to my, my black belt friends like, this is unbelievable. They cannot do this, you know, yeah. like a white belt teaching. Yeah. Bro, what are, what are the, cho- the, the, the choice? Yeah. So no teaching, no jujitsu. Yeah. Right? So instead, we actually need to try to help them to develop the, the community, you know? Right. And instead of just judging, you know, a white belt cannot teach. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I, th- I think that's a very good point. You know, like uh, I actually got contacted by a group that was trying to like form a more formal training program and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. I didn't have the ability to be there in person as much as they wanted. But I was like, I'm like, look, these are the resources I could provide for you. And like, that's where we're seeing again, like the sport change, because there's all sorts of like online support we can offer our mm-hmm. uh, people now that want to learn from us or learn jujitsu that they didn't have before, you know? Exactly. So, and I think maybe back in the day, like what we were talking about before, like when we were coming up, well, there was the only way to learn jiu-jitsu was firsthand from a black belt. And nothing is going to replace that ever, right? The learning firsthand, the, sure. the feel of like the a black belt's technique versus like what you're assuming that you're learning with your friend when you're just kind of like first exploring it is never going to be the same. But we don't like for me, jiu-jitsu really kind of always goes back to community and seeing the community of jiu-jitsu growing. So why would I turn away a group from people, a group of people that are really excited to want to learn jiu-jitsu, even when there's no one around to teach them? Like we need to try to embrace that group as much as we can to help them where we can, so they can keep that uh, inspiration alive in that area. Like that's how jujitsu grows as a sport, you know. Exactly. I appreciate that so much, bro. I appreciate the passion, right? They have because they are struggling much more to learn something that's available in places like here in Bali, for example, or in Singapore. Yeah. You know, have so many gyms, so many black belts, which is amazing. But there are so many places that they don't have the same. Uh, lucky, I, I would say, you know. Yeah. And it was like this everywhere, but with development of jiu-jitsu, there are still few places that they don't have knowledge. Yeah. Right? And uh, the downside of it for me is that more and more we have like blue belts and purple belts that are training jiu-jitsu, learn jiu-jitsu online, the whole AOJ um, uh, generation. Yeah. Right? They have fantastic, um, fantastic, fantastic access to techniques. Yeah. But no mentorship, mm. right? From a black belt, as you're saying, you know, that yeah. It will never. This will never change, and that's what I think we are. We are guiding our students in the process of learning jujitsu that uh, we went through, right, for years and years. And without that, it's just techniques. That's right. not quite jujitsu. Yeah, it's true. Right. So. We got to be careful with that, you know, and yeah, having a teacher, having someone that you actually 
have a great relationship with and you can communicate, you can be open. That's, again, going back to our very first subject, what you're looking in a teacher. Yeah. Somebody that cares about you and will give you advice, not just in Jiu-Jitsu, but in life. Yes. Right? I think that's... Uh, unbeatable right yeah but it's sure. hard to find that person you know yeah so it involves a lot of trust you know and where that trust begins is with the jiu-jitsu right like mm. this person's coming to trust you to learn something that they need to be vulnerable to learn you know what i mean so, so there's a certain amount of humility somebody walks in with they're like hey i want to learn this i know this is going to be really hard and it's not going to be easy mm. and even people before the first class and then after the first class they really realize how hard this is going to be and I'm hoping that you're going to be the person I can trust to t take me on this journey, you know? So it's like a very delicate thing that you're handling from the beginning and managing both sides expectations of that mm -hmm. is also a big part. I think of like being a good coach. And so it's an ongoing process for both parties. You know, it's like, how can I make myself best available to this person? Like, for uh, like what expectations they have of me to get them to where they're trying to go do they have realistic expectations mm. and like still manage to like grow a friendship and a coaching relationship with them in the sa the same time it's a uh, it could be a chaotic balance almost in a sense you know what i mean it's very unpredictable in the beginning but uh, i think what i've always said in my gym is the right people stay and the wrong people go mm. you know and then you end up with like a really good core group of people that have the same values of you and those are the people you can guide the most uh, on and off the mats. And the people that goes, um, you know, it's not that they cannot ever come back, right? I feel like, again, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's a process, right? But maybe in that uh, place and time, they feel like, you know, maybe they're looking for something else. But uh, I feel like our job as a coach is to guide them even, even in that uh subject right yes you're looking for another coach another another gym that's fine you know but i feel like with our help they can actually even find a better coach for sure you know so and i feel it's part of our job to do that if they um if they allow us of yes. course because and, and that's a it's thing that i, I would like to, to to say you know i feel there is a miscommunication there a lot in jiu-jitsu right and people want to change gyms and they don't come to you and talk to you about it yeah you know and I feel like some people do, some people don't. And I feel like try to, if I have a message to pass, try to communicate with your coach. Try to tell him or her, like, you know, I'm looking for this and maybe in this gym now I don't have that kind of training. Um, and uh, maybe, you know, you're, you're going to improve your coach because your coach will say like, okay, so maybe he's right, right? We yeah. don't have this kind of training here. There's not much I can do though because, you know, I need to focus on prioritizing this group of people. But uh, if you bear with me, maybe we can work on that, right? Yeah. Or like you're going to say, okay, maybe you can go to this gym here because they're more focused on that specific subject. Yeah. You know, but you're always welcome here. That doesn't mean you're training there, you cannot come back here. Of course. And um, if the coach, I understand why the students don't do this so often because they're also a little bit scared about what the coach will think about it. But then, then you got it, right? If the coach is upset about it and treats you badly, you're making the right choice. You're moving yes. in the in the right direction. Absolutely, right? yeah, yeah. So, you know, one way or another, things will unfold your way. Yeah, right? yeah. I think it's just really important, and this is just like a life thing in general. It's just how you end things. You know what I mean? So many people just like want to fade away and disappear. But it's like, it's such a bigger thing to for someone to come to me and be like, Justin, you know, like, jujitsu is not for me. I'm always going to fight tooth and nail for them. You know what I mean? Being like, I'm like, what do you mean it's not for you? Like, look at all the things. Look at how much you've changed. Look at how this is done for you. Um, but if they uh, if they come to me and be like, this isn't the right place for me, maybe they really want to compete at a higher level and I don't have the guys for it. Or they want to go to a place where it's more casual or mm -hmm. whatever it is, whatever balance they need, you know, they want to do self-defense or they want to fight MMA or whatever mm -hmm. it is. Like, I don't have the facility to offer them that, you know, yeah. like, but I'll always try to guide them, like you said, to the right people if I can, you know, and I'll always try to keep that door open. And I, and I think the culture of jujitsu, unfortunately, doesn't, that's an uncommon thing to see. Mm. Like, it's always this, like, I always say it's like jujitsu guilt. Like, mm. there's this weird guilt built into the culture of jujitsu where it's like, just because you want to go train somewhere else, it's like you're you're turning on your professor in some way, you know? Mm. And it's like, it's like no, man, it's a gym membership. They want to go do something else or they want to go train somewhere else. Well, that's okay. It's fine. Exactly. You know, it's like that doesn't change 
you're like it does change the relationship a little bit but it's not the end of the world you know what i mean it's like you still have your team you still have the rest of your guys which goes all the way around too right I yeah feel like there is a, a like a sense of loyalty that you need to have in jiu-jitsu that's a, I, I i can't uh, disagree more you know yeah. i think loyalty comes from you right you need to be loyal to yourself and if you feel like you're not happy here you gotta move on and it's like everything like in relationships right yes yes but again Communication is the key, right? You can yeah. talk about things. Maybe you can improve, but maybe not. Maybe you're right. You need to move on. Yeah. Right? Um, it's very true. And man, I, I know for even from my personal experience, there's been times where I like, I loved my team. They were mm-hmm. a great team, but it ran its course. And I needed a change if I was going to continue to train. It was either that or I was going to quit. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's like, not everyone has that perfect relationship with jiu-jitsu and their coach and their team. As much as we'd like it, it's like, it's a beautiful thing when you see someone go white to black ball under a coach. It yeah. really is. But not everyone gets that experience. Most you, people will not, especially nowadays. With, yeah. Like, the world is an open place, right? Yeah. <laughs> now, like, people are traveling, people are moving, so it's hard to, to leave someone who's going to live in one place for 12 years. Yes. Right? It's almost not possible anymore, right? Right. So how can you go from you need you gotta change coaches at some point? Yeah, and you, and you gotta make it easy for the person, you know. Like uh, I don't know why there's all this stress, and it, and it's really interesting because a lot of the time it's not even necessarily the black belt, but it's the, because it's the culture of jujitsu. The other students put it on them as well, mm. and it's like uh, it's kind of a shame, you know what I mean? Like I've I've changed teams twice in jujitsu, mm. you know, once at purple belt and then once at brown belt, and it's like. It's a hard decision for that person to make, especially if you're part of a big team. Like, especially like uh, the team I left at Brown Belt. Like, I'd been coaching at that gym for years. I was a really big part of that team. So for me to leave, I was. It wasn't just me leaving, you know, my coach. It was also me leaving like another 250 people that trained at mm. that gym. So for me, it was a really hard decision. You know what I mean? And uh, you know, obviously, some shame and guilt came with it on probably both sides about the seeing that person move on but it was like it's what i needed to do if i wanted to keep training you know and i and if i wouldn't have made that choice i wouldn't be living in asia right now you Mm -hmm. know what i mean from there i went to living in thailand and then bali and then like that's my my life my career my last eight years of my life nine years of my life you know um but yeah i wish the culture made it a little bit easier for everyone you know communication man it's so big barriers like people are sometimes also i think especially I think especially men. <laughs> yeah. Too afraid of having tough conversations. Yeah. Right? And you prefer just you prefer just end things the way it is, you know? Yeah. Um or not. Or keep that feeling and you know I'm gonna stick with this because I'm loyal to my coach. And that's yeah. what I'm talking about, right? And uh if you're my students <laughs> listen to this, <laughs> yeah. please come and talk, you know, like you will f- we'll figure this out together, you know, because you know that our relationship is way more important than jujitsu. Yes. Right. Yeah, that that's the other thing. It's hard too. It's like sometimes they decide that jujitsu is not for them, but I'm like, oh, but we're still friends. But for them, once the jujitsu is gone, then it's like an awkward relationship for them almost sometimes <laughs> too. I'm like, well, what happened to my friend? Yeah. You know what I mean? I thought we were friends too. You know? Yeah. So it's an interesting journey but being a jujitsu coach. It's actually very interesting because I feel you know, like as a coach, we are always some also pushing. No, no, you 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 can make it. You know, you're struggling now and you can overcome it you already did once twice but sometimes stopping is good you yeah know? giving it a break um opens your mind so for so many other things and jiu-jitsu will find you back you know yeah for sure i stopped jiu-jitsu for almost like five years you know mm. um not uh, fully i was always coming back and train and even competing you know yeah from time to time it's like calling my coach and say can you please sign up sign me up to a competition yeah but you're not training. You say like, you know, I I, I don't care. I want to compete. You know, yeah. I have that feeling that I want to compete. And you know, he was always upset at me and saying, "You're an asshole." But you yeah. know, <laughs> I, well, I I think that kept me close to jiu-jitsu. You know, mm. or like sometimes you you stop training, but you still want to go to the gym. You still want to hang out with people. Yeah, you know what I mean. Um, yeah. So giving it a break, it's actually can be very health for your for your relationship with jiu-jitsu. Yeah, I think even like, you know, I've done jiu-jitsu since 2005 
and I took one break. I took like, I think it was like six or nine months off. And I remember, I, I'm pretty sure I talked to you and I talked to some of our other friends, some other jujitsu black belts. And they're mm -hmm. like, Justin, it could be one of the healthiest decisions you ever make for your jujitsu. Because I was just so burned out. Mm -hmm. You know, and sometimes we just burn out and taking a break is really what they need. Exactly. And I remember like there would just be days where, especially that I really wanted to train and then I couldn't. And I was like, I'm like, oh, this is building the fire. Mm -hmm. You know, this is really changing like everything. So now when I come back, I'm going to be hungry. And mm. the fire is going to be, and the passion's there. Nice. And then, you know, since since I've been back, it was like, I, looking back at the break, it was one of the healthiest things I ever did for myself, you know? It's because for us, like, you know, people see it, you know, like, we kind of live the dream, right? Yeah. Teaching jiu-jitsu, working jiu-jitsu, but it's also too much of jiu-jitsu. Right? Yes, it's a lot of jiu-jitsu. <laughs> yeah, so, and sometimes it, we get, uh, we burn out, as you said, right? Yeah. So we have to show up to class, we cannot skip class, then you're teaching young kids you're teaching adults you're teaching privates you're teaching so many people which is awesome when you are on that mindset yeah but sometimes you know you get overwhelmed and then you feel like you know i don't feel like putting the gear and going train myself yeah which actually has a lot of joy behind it like like we were rolling yesterday yeah and you're happy for the rest of the day right yeah so from that kind of rolling you know but sometimes you just don't feel like it because you spend the whole week teaching it's right? a lot of giving exactly it's a lot of giving yeah um so we gotta find the balance right yeah and like i think that's a really important thing for like anyone in what, whatever you do especially if you like work in your passion it's like you gotta ask yourself is this filling my cup mm -hmm. or is it taking away from my cup and i gotta evaluate that every once in a while like uh teaching fills my cup a lot of the time but eventually I need to do jujitsu for me every once in a while too you know mm -hmm. and and that always will pour back into my students uh, like yeah, uh, again, yesterday was a perfect example. Me and Marcelo haven't trained in like probably more than three years, mm. um, and we finally got like you know, COVID's been happening, borders were shut, and we we had some amazing times training together when we were younger too. <laughs> we used to just battle, and it was epic. Yeah. It was so good, <laughs> and uh, and to open that door so we could train together again was just meant so much to us, mm. and it, it's something that resonated especially with me throughout the day. And we were talking about it, just how powerful jujitsu is. Is like just having another sparring partner of mm. high level and skill to kind of move around with and seeing what our jiu-jitsu actually, actually looks like mm. when we're not toning it down. You know mm. what I mean? Um, was was something really rewarding for me. It was just like, I'm like, oh, this is what I can do. Mm. This is where what my jiu-jitsu actually looks like when I roll with someone else of high level, you know? Exactly. And, uh, you know, it's kind of like the sacrifices we make almost. I mean, Singapore's got a better scene than, than Bali does. Like, um, but just... Now with borders opening, we're finally starting to get black belts to come through again. Mm. Um, like I think a big part of me on my own personal journey with jiu-jitsu is I love the grassroots approach. Mm. Like I've taught jiu-jitsu in areas where there wasn't a lot of jiu-jitsu. Mm. So I got to share a lot of jiu-jitsu and inspire uh, jiu-jitsu with people that normally didn't get to see it. Mm. And then coming from a place like California or you coming from Brazil where it's yeah. like saturated, right? There's tons yeah. of jiu-jitsu. Yeah. So like... Uh, our predecessors already did their work there. They mm -hmm. they created the culture, and we just want to share that culture with people, you know? Exactly. And I'm always talking about it with my coaches back in Singapore, you know, because they come to Singapore because they want to work with Jiu-Jitsu, and I'm actually teaching them how to work with Jiu-Jitsu. But yeah. I need to always teach them the other side of it, right? Yeah. The other side, the other side of working with your passion, you know? And, uh, man, we have great conversations, you know? And a lot of growth behind it because it's, I was talking, to, uh, we were talking about it before, right? And um, <clears throat> even though we know this, right? But to find the balance, we got to struggle, you know? And uh, I remember the time that you were talking to me about it, you know, that you were thinking of not quitting, but take a break or something like this, you know? And those moments are actually beautiful, right? They're yeah. necessary for your growth. But if you if you didn't have that, you wouldn't be here. Yes. Right? How amazing it would be if um, we actually have that mentality when you're struggling, right? Yes. When you're struggling, you say like, you know, this is hard, but I am exactly where I should be. Yeah. Going through exactly what I should be going through. And this will bring me to something amazing. Yes. You know? So... I mean, that's my personal um, experience. And Jiu-Jitsu taught me that. And I carry this on to life. You know, whatever, like, tough situation life brings to me, I have that feeling, you know, this is tough, but I'm growing. 
Yeah. You know, and I'm going to make make it, you know. <laughs> yeah, for sure. It's powerful, huh? Exactly. I want to talk a little bit about jujitsu lifestyle with you because I think it's like, uh, I know for me, I don't know. Did you guys ever, it's called Arte Suave, the videos that mm-hmm. are like VHS tapes. Did you ever see those when you started on, on the mat made them? I don't know if it was just a, a thing in California. Arte Suave. Yeah, it was, the, it was the name of a DVD, uh, like a DVD series mm-hmm. that they made early on. But I it was all know. about jujitsu culture in Rio. Okay. And like uh, they followed a bunch of guys around. Like Andre Gavals in it. He's a brown belt. Mm-hmm. Jacques Ray's in it. Uh, I think Hoyler Gracie, nice. a couple other guys. But they're also like kind of showcasing like growing, like living in Rio and they're all surfing and it's showing mm, the nice. jujitsu lifestyle. Okay. You know what I mean? And then, of course, with that, they're traveling and they're competing. Mm. And I remember seeing that. Like I was like probably a white belt when I saw these, you know? And it was like, I'm like, that lifestyle seems so cool to me. Like that's <laughs> the lifestyle I want for myself. Was there something about jujitsu lifestyle that really like attracted you and brought it in? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Well, we see these things and you get you can't not um, really be inspired, right? Yeah. That's the thing all about it nowadays. We have you're talking about a DVD that you watched like years and years it was ago, in like 2005. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about DVDs. Let's say that and you bro, know, bro. Nowadays, everything is about it. Yeah. Right? People makes like really cool videos about anything and then yeah. you feel like doing that yeah right? it's yeah. amazing it gets inspired yeah and uh the jiu-jitsu lifestyle is really inspiring right for example i'm here in bali now my friends in brazil are watching my videos on instagram yeah and it's like man this is amazing right but again this is for me just the how it looks like yeah, you know, on the daily basis is a completely different thing, right? The Absolutely. process that you're gonna we go through to get in there is very different, and and those things are the ones that I'm interested about, you know, the the life lessons and all these things that Jiu Jitsu bring to me. That's a real Jiu Jitsu lifestyle for me. Yes, you know what I mean. It's yeah. actually living uh, Jiu Jitsu, not yeah. just training Jiu Jitsu, right? Right. Because on the videos we just see training, yeah, you know, and travel, going, yeah, travel, going yeah. to the beach. There's not much of learning that. It's just like yeah. experiencing, right? Yeah. Which, which is very important. But um, yeah, the real jiu-jitsu lifestyle for me is way deeper, you know, than yeah. that. You know, but I don't know any other martial art that has like travel really built into it. Mm. Like I, when I think of jiu-jitsu, it's the only one where people say like, I want to travel and train with this. You see it a little bit in judo, I think. But it's like the culture of jiu-jitsu has this like travel train mm. kind of vibe with it. At least like... And I think, especially with uh, coaches like you and coaches like me, that were like we left home to go teach jujitsu in other countries, mm. so it was a big part of our, our journey with it. You know, that made it interesting. You know. Yeah, I never thought about it, uh, but yeah, I think it's not just this part of uh, that that kind of differs jujitsu from other martial arts. Yeah. Right. But I think. The real reason that uh, jiu-jitsu is different from the other martial arts that brought these opportunities of traveling, right? Because it got yeah. so popular everywhere. Yeah. Like kind of almost like overcoming all the other martial arts, right? Yeah. Which I think is because of this like never end uh, learning. Yes. Which other martial arts, yeah, of course, I, uh, I'm sorry because I'm not a specialist in any other martial art, right? Yeah. Uh, to say... But I feel like some martial arts, you hit the, you know, I, I know pretty much all the techniques about it. Yeah. You know? Of course, there is so much more to develop. But jiu-jitsu is not like this, right? right? The techniques that you know today, in five years' time, will be completely different. Yeah, they'll be obsolete in five years. you got to change. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, and I think that's where people get so hooked, you know? Yeah. you got to keep learning every day. Yeah. You know, if you think that you know too much, you will fail. Yes. You know what I mean? If you think you know enough, you will fail, you know? Yes. And I think that part that uh, is really the difference. And as it became so popular and it's still growing everywhere in the world, open so many doors to travel. Yes. Right? I think that's where um, the traveling is attached to jiu-jitsu. And traveling means learning. Traveling mm. means progressing. Traveling means discovering. Yeah. Which is exactly what jiu-jitsu is. Yes. Right? That's why for me and my, my program, uh, Enjoy the Process, we are always talking about traveling. You know, mm. always trying to... Uh, we are talking a lot about making this uh, bridge in between Singapore and Bali uh, through our academies. And um, 
this is very important for me, you know, to my students to come here to Bali and train with you for a week and discover, like, and and um, and uh, learn the the essence of living here in Bali and what Jiu Jitsu looks like here, which is different than in Singapore. It's yeah. a whole different experience, right? Right. And I feel like when they come back, they are different different people. Yes. Especially my coaches, right? Yeah. I want them to experience this same same. This change in my life, traveling and meeting people all over the world. So, yeah, it's much more than actually just traveling as like leisure, you know, going to the yeah. beach and, you know, drinking and partying. It's yeah. not what we're speaking here. Like, no, you're talking about deep um, self discover, you know, 100%. And like you touched on something that's really special, too. And like I experienced this, experienced this for the first time in 2010. And it's a lot of the reason why I eventually moved out to Asia. But I did my first trip outside the U.S. and I went to I went to Thailand and I went and trained at Tiger Muay Thai, and there was a black belt training there. I trained in Bangkok also. I trained with two guys. I trained with Adam Kayum and Ray Elby, and uh, it was just I was in this state of wonderlust. There's no other word for it. Like mm. I was just so stimulated and inspired by the world around me mm. that anything I learned on that trip was absorbed into me like super quick because I was in this great state of being open and learning that you get when you're traveling and especially in a place that like inspires you you know exactly so I think that's something that's really special about going to a place like Bali and training you know mm. what I mean and especially for coaches to experience that it's like uh like for me that came back when I came back to the states I was so motivated to train and like get my black belt because I saw what was on the other side after like because I think that by that time I was a purple belt mm. so a few a few years later I get my or I was a brown belt and I was like on the cusp of being a black belt you know mm. so it was like I knew if I started traveling all these opportunities were going to start opening up for me mm. you know and then by the time I got my black belt it was like the world's my oyster I could go anywhere and teach pretty exactly. much you know and uh and it's such a great experience you know uh talk a little bit more about enjoy the process yeah I mean taking that opportunity and um just talk about the traveling part. I feel like this is something that I'm always, I'm consistently trying to grow our network because of that, you know, like the process of learning Jiu Jitsu can be very overwhelming. And I feel like there is so many talent people um, everywhere, especially in Brazil, because this is where I come from and know more people, but yeah. everywhere that uh, if, if only they had the opportunity of traveling somewhere, experience a new language, a new culture, meeting people and connect with people through their passion, which is Jiu Jitsu, they will, they will become a different person, you know, a different, um, a whole different person, right? That's yeah. you said, like, that's why I created through the Enjoy the Process, the internship program where I bring the coaches to Singapore. And if it is like a month or two months, three months, usually we do one month or three or six months, right? In those, let's say three months, everything that you that you do is learning. Yeah. Everything is new. You feel like a, a child again, you know, mm. especially if you don't speak the language. You need to learn how to talk. You need to learn how to walk on the street because everything is different. And you just absorb everything, just like you said. And I yeah. remember my first year in Singapore was just, wow. Yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I couldn't be happier because I was just learning so much. And I think one of the biggest things in my Enjoy the Process, which is my Jiu Jitsu program, is opening opportunity for people to have that experience. Where it's going to lead them, I don't know. Uh, who, I'm, who am I to control it? But if, if I'm able to connect them with people to have that experience, I'm going to be the happiest guy in the world because they know, you know, you're making really. Um, positive impact in people's life yeah. not just on their life but their whole family and you know the whole circle around them and the gyms that they're going to especially if they come to Singapore and uh, spend time with me which is the ideal scenario and yeah like I can guide them through this uh, Jiu Jitsu experience before they go somewhere else that's you know that's fantastic are you only taking coaches from Brazil or are you taking people from other countries also? No, from everywhere. Okay, so like, whoever. let's say like I'm a purple belt and I'm living in America and I want to come out and live in Asia and learn jiu-jitsu. They can go to enjoy the process and get an opportunity through your internship to maybe go teach in another gym in Asia. Yeah, definitely. You know, first um, come to, to train with us in Singapore for us to know each other better, you know, because 
character is something that is really important, right? Yeah. Your ability in jiu-jitsu for me is the least important, you know, because yeah. I'm actually, you know, it. I'm sorry to say, but I'm very confident that I can teach jiu-jitsu, you know, right. someone and build up from scratch, like, um, to the level that I think you are able to coach, yeah. right? Especially if you're already like a blue or purple belt, you know? Um, but uh, character is super important, right? And yeah. Whenever I send someone here to to Bali, I say, Justin, and I have this guy here that came to my internship program. He's looking for a place to train or even coach. You know, I need to make sure that you know this guy is going to represent me here, right? Right. Uh, otherwise, we are burning our relationship, and I would never do that. Um, right. So yeah, I mean. If you are a purple belt or a blue belt and you want to just experience more jiu-jitsu, right? Yeah. Even if you don't even have that coaching mentality, if you just want to train jiu-jitsu and like full time, yeah. come to Singapore, or if you have other uh, goals in life, which is like studying like whatever it is, if you want to become a doctor or a lawyer, but you want to study in Singapore, right? Yeah. And I can make that um, that connection, you know. And you also want to train jiu-jitsu because you're very passionate about jiu-jitsu. Right. Why? Why not? You know what I mean. Yeah. I think uh, following your passion doesn't need to be something that you can do hundred percent, but you can mix your passion with something that you actually um, want to build a career at. You know. Right. So you don't necessarily need to work with jujitsu, but why not? You yeah. Know? <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. And like, you know, I think for a lot of coaches too, it's just like at least in the states. It's it's a, like a, a part time job for a lot of people, mm. you know what I mean? I, whereas I think for us out here, it turns into more of a lifestyle mm. because um, th there are opportunities here for that, you know what I mean? Where it can be your career and where you can build more of a life for yourself around it. Uh, a lot of factors go into that. Uh, some of some of it I've always just said is like the culture of Asia. They're they're much more embracing of martial arts mm. and uh, they they respect the role that we play a lot more. Mm. Um, and then also just like cost of living. A quality of life is different you know what i mean then at least at least for me like being from the states singapore might be a little bit more tricky because the cost of living there is quite high it is um but i think also it's a place that respects martial arts as a culture mm. um and they want to have high quality coaches there so they try to take care of them you know for sure for sure and just now we had we start having coaches coming uh from different countries you know and uh experiencing our internship in a different way uh, which are people that not necessarily want to to have to become a, a coach. Yeah. You know? uh, they just want to improve their jujitsu and train with us like full time for a certain period of time because the door is open now for yeah. traveling. Um, but um, it's a whole different thing as well when you have someone that's actually like just my coaches in Singapore now, the two brown belts, Jay and Charlie. They are. They came to become coaches. You know, they came. They left everything back home to become a coach. So that's it's a different uh, different scenario, right? Yeah. Um, so they have to go through English school to learn English. So it's just you're hundred percent focused on that. Yeah. Um, that's a different type of internship, I would say. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, like I mean, it's really special, and I think as coaches, it's very rare where we get those students that kind of come along, and mm. we see that they're on the same journey that we're on, almost, mm. you know. And you just try your best to guide them through the experience of what they need. And and for you, how how uh, like remember we kind of touched on earlier, like how Italo inspired you mm -hmm. to maybe start doing some traveling and and competing in jujitsu. Now look what you're doing for those guys because they're coming to mm. Singapore. You couldn't speak English when you got to Singapore, so now you're doing the same for these guys. You'd be like, let's put you in English school, let's get you learning English, let's get you training jiu-jitsu. So they saw you can do it, now exactly. they know they can do it, and you're going to give them the same, if not better, opportunities for as they sure. come for, up. You know? For all the people as well, they will open doors and tell them, this, like, you guys are going to open much more, many m many other doors for all the people, right? Yeah. And uh, touching the other subject again, right? Learning English for me, it's, um, it's necessary for them to... To evolve their jiu-jitsu you know? yes yes As we absolutely were speaking, right and uh if they want to work with jiu-jitsu they definitely need to learn english and um for me it's like i'm i feel just so blessed to have had that opportunity before and it's not something that i want to do it's something that i have to do open doors for more people to have um the experience i had because i know how it changed my life you know, I know how it still changes my life every day, right? Yeah. So it's kind of the way to 
to make our world a better place, right? With yeah. more people in the journey of discovering themselves and upgrading themselves, yeah. right? It changes the whole environment, the whole environment around them, you know, as I said, not just themselves, but the students have a better training because the quality of teaching is higher, right? Yeah. Um, their family gets inspired of learning another language, you know, because, you know, my son is learning another language, my boyfriend, my my girlfriend, whatever, you know. Yeah. We have had girls coming to the internship as well, which is really nice, right? Girls coming all the way from different countries to, it happens a lot here in Bali, mm. right? Yeah. You see girls coming by themselves from mm. Europe, especially, right? Yeah. To train Jiu-Jitsu and uh, we didn't think about it like, like 10 years ago, right? Right, yeah, I, again, it's that travel culture of jiu-jitsu that's such mm -hmm. a big part of it now. Exactly. And uh, I think more, we see more and more of that because we have destination, we're at a destination mm. place, you know? Singapore as well, a lot of people pass through Singapore while they're traveling through Asia, so they want to train while they're passing through. Bali is a huge destination for travelers, so mm. now we see people traveling with geese, you know? Yeah. Uh, and then they just want to travel with their gi and train wherever they're going. And it's uh, such a cool spark, part of the it, culture it, of the sport, you know? It is, man. It is. And I feel like that's what differs is a little bit of the old school. Like, uh, I think there was a lot of control from the black belts, you know? Mm. And the not sharing generation, yeah. you know? That you're very care careful with who you share your, your knowledge. And, you know, I had the chance of traveling the world doing jiu-jitsu and it ends on me right? right i don't want to open doors to other people i'm not here like saying that i'm better than those guys because of, of course they had reasons right yeah to do that but uh you know again jiu-jitsu is evolving so sh shall we right Evolve, yeah. and uh i think that's the difference now like we are much more open um community where sharing is is what matter the most because that's how we grow yeah you know? um and open doors for these guys to have this experience you know it's it really fills my my feed my soul you know? yeah for sure <laughs> it's amazing so like uh so, since you and i kind of have similar journeys in the sense that we've been in it for the long haul we've been doing it for mm -hmm. a long time yeah. what are some of the like biggest pitfalls you see people that hold them back or eventually lead them to quitting jujitsu mm. So I just think, can you... Yeah, so <laughs> like uh, examples in your, from your experience where people have quit jiu-jitsu, like what are the, what do you think are the common ones to come up? I'll give you an example, like mm. uh, I've seen students quit that are too caught up with comparing themselves to others, you know? So like this blue belt beat me, so this means I'm no good. Now I don't want to train jiu-jitsu anymore. What would you say to a student coming to you with something like that? Well, I first of all, this is one of also the our philosophy of enjoy the process, right? If you compare yourself to others, you will never enjoy anything. Yes. Right. So the number one mentality, right? I need to be the number one. You will always have Jiu Jitsu teaches us in the early stages, right? You will always have someone better than us. Right. You know. So, and this is what this is about. Is it's a, uh, it's a. Uh, personal growth experience right if you are better than you almost every day you're doing amazing right yeah but i know that uh life check on us like every day and try to you know like you're gonna spar with that guy that's used to beat you up and then you just it's hard to not do that exercise right of comparing yourselves to to others yeah but I, I honestly think that you know this will not lead you anywhere you might be better you might get better with that uh comparison yeah. you know i think competition raises the level raises the bar right you yeah. might you might get better in jiu-jitsu but you're not learning yeah how to deal with your problems right. in a health way right you know what i mean you're not managing it because it will we will be always comparing you to others you're not just on the mats but in real life right so and then you're gonna get yourself doing things that doesn't bring you any joy just to reach the next level and the next level and the next level so you're not actually help uh happy you're not grateful for being where you are now doing right. what you're doing now you know so which I think it's a big problem, you know, it can lead you us to like really um, bad thoughts and depression, you know. Right, for sure. I think uh, it's a common thing we see 
I think in people's, I mean, some people, it's like a lot, the, the entire time they do jiu-jitsu, they struggle with this. I know, like, it was a really big struggle of mine until I was probably about a, a brown belt. And then I think around brown, I started to chill out with it a little bit mm. more. And I think where I really made peace with it was after I'd been a black belt for a little while. Mm. Uh, because I came up in a very competitive environment also. Mm. And uh, I I put so much pressure on the competition. And it not only did it affect my performance, but it affected my relationship with my team. And it would affect my relationship with jujitsu and, you know, outside of jujitsu as well. So, like, uh, it, it took me a long time to chill out on that. You know what I mean? And then I think when I really started to enjoy the process, mm. that's where things really shifted for me. And I realized it was just like, well, maybe I've been way too competitive about all this. You know what I mean? Like, this, these are areas that I could have chilled out more with and I would have learned a lot faster. Mm-hmm. And then seeing the difference in that growth. But it took me that, you know, that took me over 10 years to figure that out. And if I could help someone figure that out in their first couple of years of jiu-jitsu, imagine what their growth would be, you know? That's for sure. Yeah. Like you told me this yesterday when you were rolling, right? It's yeah. Like, you know, like the first time we came here, like you're much more competitive, right? Yeah. And even the second, the third time. The first time I came here was my first year in Asia. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. Um, and I think that was a big shift for me because as we spoke earlier, there was a point that I was training jiu-jitsu in this amazing place, uh, teaching, sharing with people what I love the most. But I still had these feelings of, you know, something is not quite right. You know, I'm not happy. Yes. Because of that competition environment that I was at, you know. Right. Nothing bad to say about the guys, but uh, it was just too much of competition, right? We live together, train together. We go to other gyms to train with other people, and then we are always talking about training. How is you training with this guy? What did you do? And what this is like was kind of making me feel like you know I'm competing all the time. I don't want that. Yes. You know? I want to learn. I want to improve. And that's why I figure you know I start isolating myself and say like, okay, so what if I start losing? Mm. You know, what if I allow myself to lose? Yes. You know? And then I start learning. I started progressing because I feel like, you know, this guy passed my guard once, twice, three times. And then I got why and how. And then I start learning more about it. And then I feel like, well, I start getting another level. You yes. know, when I start allowing myself to lose. Yeah. And I think this is a very important um, um way of thinking, right? To, to put ourselves in difficult positions, not like... Um, I want to go to the gym and then just get on the side control. I'm not saying that, you know, like with a top level black belt, that's going to be yeah. really hard to move. <laughs> but, you know, trying to explore more, not always doing what you're good at, because you know that sometimes if you're good at something, you're going to make it work. Yeah. Right. But and then when you try something new, you might fail. Yes. Right. And lose the sparring. But I feel like that's where you grow. Yes. You know? I think you hit the nail on the head with the word explore. Like, when I started looking at jiu-jitsu, like, you know, like, sometimes I would just go in the mentality where I was just the warrior. That was, like, the warrior persona was mm-hmm. all I had. But when I started to look <laughs> at it to explore with, like, the persona of more like a scientist, mm-hmm. and I'm just testing and nice. seeing how things are and stuff, my jiu-jitsu grew tenfold, you know? And, like, even, like, we had a really nice, like, flow training session today, and it's, like, being comfortable enough like and this is also a trust thing i'm just gonna let you put me in an armbar so i can work my armbar escapes exactly but so many guys won't even let you put them in an armbar they're Mm -hmm. so guarded and it's like well how are you ever going to be prepared to be in an arm lock if you never let yourself be put in one you know what i mean and again this is all metaphors in a lot of ways for like other uh, other areas of life it's like i've never put myself in vulnerable situations how do i know how to uh to work my way through it you know what i mean um like no risk no reward almost sort of thing um I was having this conversation with one of my coaches like not so long ago that I think I could see his eye like was kind of like uh, mind blowing, right? Because it is a big thing of coaches not tapping to their students, right? Yes. I, I, I actually forgotten about it, you know, yeah. because my students are beating me up every day. Yes. You know? <laughs> I kind of teach them to do that. And yeah. I'm consistently going through, um, put, I'm actually aspiring with me is the best opportunity for me to see what are they capable of, what are my teachings, uh, you know, the movements, the pattern, the connection between the techniques that I that I'll be teaching them. Right. So imagine if I'm teaching them all about connections and movement, but say I break those movements in the first 
start and then I pass the guard, submit, and that's all. Yeah. And I feel like it's still there are a lot of coaches doing that. Yeah. And I ask my my coach this um, this question right uh, after we having a whole conversation about his students' progression. They feel like you know this person is not progressing, and then he feels this and that. I feel like uh, let me ask you this question: When was the last time this guy submit you in a sparring? Yeah. And then he look at me and say like, never. Yeah. I look at him and say like, you see, maybe it's that confidence that you're killing his confidence every day in yeah. training that he will not you're not gonna see him like flourishing if yeah. you don't allow him to do so yeah right and this kind of thing that's you know doesn't need to be sad when you're coaching someone but it's more like the way you behave the way you carry yourself on the mats that yeah. i feel like you're giving people opportunity to explore yes you know to discover yes you know what i mean and that's I feel like there are a lot of still a lot of black belts failing on that. Yeah. With the ego mentality, you know. I will never tap to my students. Yeah. You know? What a horrible mindset. You know what I mean? And and it really holds back. It you're holding back your students by having that mindset, you know? Yeah. And with that said, I feel like yeah, it's it's easier to have that mindset with a white belt or a blue belt, mm. but then every student is a, a brown belt, right? Yeah. We still feel like, you know, like <laughs> there is a little bit of uh, competition there, right? Yeah, the gap is closing, right? The, exactly. So if we, everything in life has levels, right? I think this is a great opportunity to 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 teach to to learn that you know to allow ourselves to 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 leave the ego not to leave the ego i don't like that expression to yeah. actually carry your ego and deal with it uh, like right? what you want is a healthy ego right you shouldn't have no ego you know mm. what i mean because at the end of the day it's like we don't want to be so small because there is a level of confidence that comes with jiu-jitsu mm. right we want we want to have a healthy ego so what the goal is here mm. i think the word ego is attacked a little too much in jiu-jitsu and martial arts sometimes. It's like, well, we want we want to be confident. We want to be able to believe mm. in ourselves. We, and, and that's all part of a healthy ego. But yeah. we don't want our ego so blown out of proportion that we start looking down on people, right? The goal is to have the even playing field. So if uh, my, say if my ego is too small, well, then now everyone's on a pedestal. And this is the problem we see in jiu-jitsu where everyone mm. puts their coaches on the pedestal and they're not seeing them as equals. Yes. Now the other, and then it's the same the other way, right? So the, then the, we have the coach above looking down on his students. So he's not seeing them as equals either. So the goal is to get the, the healthy ego across the board and have an mm. even playing field. You know what I mean? And uh, that's why even like a lot of formalities that you see at some gyms, I try to move away from because I love the respect aspect of jiu-jitsu but sometimes there's too much like ego building pedestal stuff from the coaches sometimes so I try to move away from some of that philosophy and some of that mindset and stuff and uh, the other thing I think it's also important is I need to let see my uh, I need to let my students see me fail mm. you know what I mean so if like I'm rolling with another black belt and they tap me that's great mm. you know what I mean I'm rolling with someone else that's good and they can tap me no big deal Exactly. You know what I mean? But if, I, if I'm if i so guarded that I always protect myself and then I try to show them I have like a superhuman ability, mm. then I'm not projecting myself in a way that I would want to as a coach. You and know? also maybe it's not um, matching with what you're teaching them every day, right? Yes. You're always talking about, you know, them to, to, to chill more and focus on the process. And then whenever you have that opportunity to do it yourself, you don't. Yeah. So you're failing big time, right? Yeah, that's so, true. So, Yeah. Absolutely. I, I, I now I know what you mean before what you meant before about um um what you said. Sorry I forgot. About what? <laughs> Bring me back. Uh about like why people leave jujitsu. Yeah, no about the uh, difference uh, Oh the yeah, ego, yeah, putting, having the healthy no, ego. No, putting putting the teacher sometimes in uh, in a, such a Oh like on a, a pedestal. Yeah, pedestal. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's uh that's a big problem, you know, like uh and I think the solution for this problem is always Again, communication. That's the one. And, and I think that uh, we are failing too much in communication in jiu-jitsu, you know? Yeah. Like, I remember myself so many times when a student asked a silly question, a silly question, then I just turn down and say, like, respond in a bad way. Yeah. Right? But if someone is asking a silly question, you got to understand why. Yeah. You know? And then improve that communication. Don't... Because if you, if you answer it uh, badly, you actually... 
making everybody else not asking you more question. Yes. Right. Yeah. And I think this is a big problem, especially here in Asia. As you said, that's the downside of it. People are so respectful mm. that they don't really want to ask. You know, you yeah. teach a very complicated technique, and you look to the room that have thirty people in the room and say like any question, they say no. I say, guys, listen. I have questions about this. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so how, how you don't? Please yeah. ask questions because that's how you're gonna learn. Yeah. You know. And yeah. Yeah, and I think that's. I mean, you touched on it earlier. Like you learning English was you remembering what it is to be a student. And I, I think again, that's like a another problem is uh, you see really good jujitsu coaches that are such good teachers at teaching jujitsu, but. Mm-hmm. They're really not good teachers at teaching jujitsu because they forget what it is to be a student because mm-hmm. their ability is so Absolutely. high that they don't know how to explain it to a beginner. So it's like once you've lost a beginner, it's like, well, you really stop being a coach now. You know what I mean? It's like your job to slow down. It's my job to be patient. It's my job to check my ego. Mm. It's my job to remember how hard this is to learn. And if they don't understand it, I need to explain it differently. You know what I mean? So it's like, uh, or just like, again, like managing their feelings and their expectations and their boundaries and all that stuff is another huge part of it. And each student will bring us a different challenge, right? Oh, 100%. A totally different challenge. Yeah. And and it's really interesting because sometimes each student is just a reflection of your own journey in jujitsu too. And it's like, (laughs) you know what I mean? It's like, man, I was just like this guy (laughs) from these years on, you know what I mean? And it's, it's very revealing. And the challenge that I'm talking about is actually opportunities for you to grow as a coach, right? Because you're going to find students that uh, their ability to move is almost zero, yeah. you know? And that person, you're going to have to break down what you already broke down, like... Even more. Even more and more. Yeah. And then you got to be patient and go back there to explain the same thing, which in our culture is something that we don't usually do, right? Yes. You say like, you know... I, I just explained this. How come you guys don't don't yeah, uh, I don't like pay attention, focus? You know, yeah. there's that kind of like m- mentality, right? Which, bro, I came a long way to to change that, and I still feel sometimes, you know, um, these opportunities for growth. Right? Yeah, I say you know, like have to be more patient. It is, I remember today in class, I think the word that I used the most was patient you know yeah. you gotta be patient to pass some more guard you cannot rush you yeah. know what I mean and this is one of the things that you just taught me the most how to be patient <laughs> absolutely <laughs> uh, yeah well Marcelo it was great to have you on I hope you enjoyed this this process Amazing, of being on the really. podcast how do people get in touch with you how do they reach you oh, they can uh, find us on enjoy the process BJJ Instagram um, yeah I think for now it's Th- that's our, the best web, way. our website is coming up hopefully next month there is always something happening you know yeah for sure so yeah make sure to check out enjoy the process bjj on instagram Mm -hmm. um marcelo thank you for being on um again if you guys want to have other uh, platforms to listen to this we're on spotify we're on uh, apple music and obviously on youtube and uh yeah thanks thanks for coming on thank you so much for having me justin always a pleasure seeing you after such a long time and i'm really really grateful for this time we're spending together and sharing with you guys um a little bit of our journey. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Thanks, my brother. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs>